seguramente habrá muchos, pero todos deben de confluir y tener como horizonte común el avanzar hacia el diseño e implantación de un nuevo modelo de desarrollo, lo cual no estará exento de dificultades. La lucha cotidiana sigue siendo necesario para la toma de conciencia. Probablemente esta asamblea se planteará muchos desafíos, pero no se debe caer en el error que generaron en su momento los determinantes sociales de la salud, los cuales fragmentaron la realidad y desviaron el esfuerzo que la humanidad debió hacer contra el modelo hegemónico de desarrollo. Termino acá. Debemos cambiar el modelo de desarrollo. No hay otro camino. Seremos lo suficientemente valientes, tendremos el coraje necesario para enfrentar los retos y cambiarlo antes de que sea demasiado tarde. La Asamblea Mundial para la Salud de los Pueblos tiene, para, tiene la palabra. Muchas gracias. ¡Qué color tabla! Good morning. 
I'd like to recognize here our comrades who come from far away, long journeys, difficult processes, and we apologize for any inconvenience. You will be pleased to know that the last comrade who was detained has been released, Dr. Roman. the local organizing committee and especially Sir Abed from Brack who has a way of getting ministers to do what he likes. <laughs> so you will notice comrades that I am wearing a Palestinian scarf. People's Health Movement has an active chapter in Palestine. We're in solidarity with their struggle against illegal occupation. And similarly, as Fran said, in solidarity with the Rohingya refugees who Bangladesh is hosting. And of course, the many other displaced persons and refugees mentioned by Eduardo in his wonderful address. And this, of course, is just a symptom of the terrible situation in which many people are forced to live as a result. Western Sahara. Yes, and the continuing occupation of Western Sahara, and we have one representative from there here. So I'd like to, before beginning, thank the local organizing committee, particularly the chair Zakir Hossein, the GK organization, and special thanks to Breck, who stepped in when we had to move our venue and delay the conference by one day. I want to also thank right up front the Global Secretariat who has been working extremely hard for very long hours for a long time. And especially Amit Sen Gupta and Gagir Kanakabalai So I'm now going to speak, I'm going to be covering material which has been covered by others, so I will go quite fast, but what I'm trying to do is give an overview of what we will be discussing over the next four days in much greater depth than is being described in my talk. I will also then refer to this report. I understand it is not yet in your packs. It is. Not yet. So this should be in your packs. In here is the report from the PHM Global Organization to you about progress since the last assembly in 2012. So please pick one of these up. It also contains our statement from PHM and almost 200 other organizations at the 40th anniversary celebration of Al Mahata in Astana. It's an alternative civil society statement. So I will now start. So we have been told about progress in world health and there has been progress. This looks at life expectancy between 1990 and 2012. 
and you can see that there's been an increase in life expectancy. But Southeast Asia, where we are now, and Africa lag well behind. You will live shorter in those regions of the world. Young child mortality is concentrated, as this map shows, in Africa, India, and other South Asian countries. That is where most child deaths are taking place. Similarly, cases of tuberculosis concentrated in the same parts of the world. Death of women associated with pregnancy and childbirth in the circle is Africa. The rates are much higher and the decline in maternal mortality is much slower. Inequalities are growing. In 1970, a child born in Africa was nine times more likely to die than a child born in an industrialized country. And now, the ratio is 11 times. So progress has been slower even when health problems are worse. And within countries, inequalities have grown. In the circle is India, you can't see all the bars. Take it from me that the under five mortality ratio is three to one between the poorest and the richest 20% of the population. A three times, a threefold difference. We had the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. Three of them were directly health related. MDG 4 was about reducing child mortality. You may not be able to see it from the back, but the world will reach its MDG 4 at current rates only by 2028. It was supposed to reach by 2015. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 2027, and in West and Central Africa only in 2032. So why? These have been gone into in detail, but in PHM's analysis there are two big causes. Poverty and increasing inequality worsened by neoliberal globalization whose effects Eduardo has described very well. And secondly, selective primary health care and inappropriate health reforms, which Sir Abe also referred to. The translation of neoliberal policies in the health sector. He mentioned quite explicitly decentralization of responsibility but often without resources, and encouragement of the private sector in all areas of health care, which inevitably leads to the richest getting better care than poorer people. I won't define neoliberal globalization, but you will recognize many of the words on this slide. We are told there is no alternative to the free market, to free trade, to unrestricted flow of capital and finance, minimal government involvement, minimal spending, and this is happening in many countries, north and south, in the rich countries and in the poor countries. In my country, South Africa, which has a brave, brave history of struggle, we now have austerity policy where posts in the public sector are being frozen. We have lost just over the last few months over 5,000 posts. So, neoliberal globalization in our analysis, BHM, operates through what we call, in brief, the social determinants, more accurately, 
social determination, there's an active process going on. Economic factors, political factors, which impact on employment, on living conditions, on food and diets, and of course, on the environment. And the second main pathway is through the health system itself. And this has been referred to. The financing of the health system, global policy influences, <coughs> medicines or the lack thereof, human resource migration, and health service delivery. There are other, of course, aspects of neoliberal globalization. We've heard about them. Population movements, and of course, communications. Communications have vastly improved but, as Eduardo also mentioned, social media is more full of useless messages and advertising than it is about the real problems of the world. And I hope that all of us who use social media as much as we do, recognize how this is displacing real conversation real analysis, and real discourse. So we will be discussing all of these matters over the next few days. And if you look at the program, and we now have the reprinted program. So we want to thank especially Amit and his small team for redoing the project. Five days into four. Special discount for all of you. <laughs> Only someone from the Asian subcontinent could have done that. <laughs> so, a new program, and the program will be going into all of these matters in much, much greater depth. So, neoliberal globalization has led to much more wealth globally than ever before in human history. The problem, of course, is that it is not equitably distributed. You can hardly see the global south here whereas with disease and death, we are well represented. So, 0.1% of the world's population now owns 84% of total global personal wealth. The world's billionaires are not only in North America and Europe and Asia, but also in Latin America, the Middle East, but predominantly in the global north. A few years ago, 65 trillion US dollars was held in offshore bank accounts, untaxed, your money and my money, because we pay for the commodities which lead to these profits, and we do not get the taxes in return. So PHM, and Eduardo has spoken about this, know that intersectoral action on the social determination of ill health is extremely important, and there is now evidence, I won't read this, but in the 10 fast-track countries, of which Bangladesh is one, in reaching MDG4, over 50% of health improvement comes from actions outside of the health sector. We have known this for a long time. It was very disappointing in Astana that hardly any discussion took place on the social determinants and on intersectoral action, unlike Al-Mahad 40 years previously. 
and Eduardo mentioned this, but this signifies something we have to struggle against as a people's movement. So we have the SDGs, which recognize the importance of other sectors. The question is, and we will discuss this in a plenary session very soon, can the SDGs be attained without a change in the current dominant neoliberal economic paradigm? Some analysts have shown that if there is no change in the current economic paradigm, it will take 207 years to achieve the SDGs and we will need 3.4 planet Earths. <laughs> so, so Abed, if you can just organize a few more planet Earths, I'd be very grateful. So I am almost finished. So we will also be talking about the second main pathway to health for all, the health sector. And Alma Ata encapsulates both health sector and social determinants. Because as Eduardo said, it wasn't just about basic health care, it was also about addressing social determinants, something which was almost off the Astana statement, but there was a big action by civil society to ensure that it remained on. So, comprehensive primary health care has made big gains in many countries, and we're in one of them at the moment, and we heard from Sir Abed about how Bangladesh made such huge progress. But there are other examples you will hear about. Nepal is a good example. There are examples now from El Salvador and other countries, Thailand, Brazil, and so on. But you know there was a split in the primary health care movement where this comprehensive vision was replaced by what we call selective primary health care. If you like, the medical components were extracted and the social ones were left behind in general, not everywhere, but in most places. And health sector reform, which Sir Abed referred to, has continuity of the selective PHC. And even WHO recognized this. And even WHO recognized this in their 30th anniversary of Almighty World Health Report, where they talked about fragmented health systems, they talked about private sector fragmenting health services and commercialization of health care. So in Almighty, there is a recognition, sorry, in Astana, there was a, a recognition that PHC is the most equitable, efficient, and effective strategy to enhance health. And it's a foundation, they say, for UHC and the SDGs. We say that UHC and the SDGs may be a way to implement comprehensive health care but PHC is the umbrella under which all of these sit. So history has shown us that without struggle, without the organization of social movements, civil society, and independent civil society, there will be little change in the current inequitable regime uh, of neoliberal capitalism. So, this assembly is also about evidence-based advocacy and ways to engage in social mobilization. 
So our first assembly, as you know, was held here. And these are the organizations that came together. And we had a huge attendance. It took place at GK and we elaborated the charter. Those of you who have never read it, should read it. It's worth reading. And it talks about action and how it may be taken. Because there was such support at the assembly, we decided to form a movement. Not just to have conferences every few years or assemblies, but to form a movement. And our movement has a number of global programs. The International People's Health University, which educates ourselves and new young comrades coming into the movement on many aspects of political economy and health. And this is just a list of our IPHU since 2012. Before 2012, we had a greater number even than these. And we just completed two IPHUs. This was one which was held in Brazil, in Kenya, and we published Global Health Watch. We had four until late last year, and we now have Global Health Watch 5, and I'm hoping that soon we will be able to download it. You can download it off the internet, free. This is our alternative world health. It is an authoritative document. Some people at WHO even read it, but they make sure they don't get caught with it in the corridor. <laughs> so, three assemblies before this one. The fourth one here. Fran showed this photo. This was in Ecuador. A PHM in South Africa. A PHA in South Africa. A call to action and a decision to focus on a few theme areas. We are here now. We had two IPHUs immediately before this assembly. One on gender and health, one on essential medicines, and there were about 70 participants altogether. So, this is my last slide. I'm going to hand over to Kiara. But our report to you, our membership, is in this. You will pick it up. You can read what we have done. So I'm not going to go into the detail. But in this report, there are regional highlights. So where does PHM exist? It now exists at the last count in about 80 countries, 8-0. But in many countries we are very small. We are just a handful of people. In India, JSA is very large. I think more than 200 affiliated organizations. In Nepal, PHM has grown very rapidly. In Bangladesh, there's a substantial organization in some Central American countries likewise. And over the last year or two, the European region has also grown. Not least because of conservative policies, withdrawal of services, migrants trying to get in, and governments turning them back, and many other such reasons. We have had coordinated action on April the 7th, World Health Day, there were actions in many, many countries around the world calling for health for all and organizing around key issues against crisis.
privatization, against austerity, for a focus on good living and working conditions. We are now strengthening a focus on our key thematic areas. So there are five thematic areas. Nutrition and food, extractive industries, the mining sector, trade and health, gender and health, and health systems and essential medicines. And over the next few days, we'll see theme, theme discussion groups organized, and we will have subgeneries to introduce them. And finally, we have strengthened and democratized our governance structures. So you can read in this document how, gov how our governance structures are arranged. We have representatives elected from each region of the world. We have representatives of our key global programs. We have some of our past coordinators represented through our advisory councils. And we are trying to renew our steering council all the time. So the average age has now dropped from about 95 <laughs> to now somewhere below 50 and we are heading down. We want more young people involved in the world. Thank you. Thanks, David. David gave a nice context of ill health and gave an overview of people's health movement from 2012 to now. Um, I'm introducing Chiara Benini next. She's uh, another, you know, the second co-chair. She's a medical doctor with a PhD, public health specialist, and a health activist. She works in Bologna at the Centre for International and Intercultural Health since it opened in 2006. She's also in part-time collaboration with Viva Salute since 2014. The main action of research is on social determination of health inequalities, migration and health, and global health. She's been involved with PHA now for more than 10 years. Kiara will speak in English. Uh, 
2018. Um, I won't go into the details, and if you want to know more, just, just come to me in the coming days, and uh, I'll be able to share with other people. Um, we have some outputs from this, from this work. And one is some uh, publication that you may have seen, we call it a manual, it's not really a manual, but it's a collection of, of uh, experiences and practices about movement building, coming from the, the larger movement, from all over the world. And it's, it's really available on, on the PHM website in, in three different languages. From that, we've also built a new section of the PHM website to make it more lively and uh, being able to update it. Uh, we also have a very, very rich report from the four-year research that we're going slowly to, to try and organize and make it more accessible. And then, of course, the, the action research delivered results on the ground in terms of different ways of carrying out action and even more effective action. And in some ways, this project also contributed to the sustainability of the movement, even though it was also a huge task because it engaged a lot of voluntary work which was not easy to, to put together. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with action research, the basic principle is that through doing things, through changing the situation that affects you, you can also generate knowledge. So you start from the people's experience, what they face, how they, how they address their problems, and then you try and systematize them, make sense of them, you can use theory to confront, and then again you go back to action, it's a spiral. So you never stop doing things. But in the process, you try to build more coherence in, in, in what you're doing and what you're learning from it. Uh, this is just snapshots from the website. So one of the outcomes that I'll be presenting briefly is these six key practices of movement building. And on the website, you can also see the 25 case studies that many people in the room contributed, from which these key practices were uh, were. So the first one, and I'll go briefly, and again, really I encourage you to visit the website. Um, the first one is relationships and values. So we felt that many of us, why we are engaged in the movement is also because we feel good in the movement. We, we, we take strength and, and life from the relationships that we build with each other. So this is very, very important for us. And it's, it's about solidarity and it's about human uh, bonds. And we also, Feel, and, and, and this is particularly strong in, in some of the areas of the globe, not in Europe, unfortunately. Uh, we feel that relationships are also with the nature zoo. And you are, I think, you spoke very, very well about this. So when we say relationships with people, we include the environment that we live in, and that it's not, not being separated. So these are key, the key messages uh, that come from these reflections to care for each other and to, uh, to welcome our diversity, which is huge, across, even across the world. Not easy at times, but uh, very rich. Uh, and that our health is the health of nature as, as, a, as a whole. And I could have fun uh, as a court, but it's quite important to have fun while we do this. Uh, I, I don't want to discuss I mean, the, the hardship that many have in this space, but uh, we really need to also rejoice in, when, when we're you know, engaged in our struggle. Um, the second key practice is about how we get organized. Uh, it does make a difference how we get organized. It has to do with the democracy uh, in our movement, it has to do with the voices that are heard or are not heard, so the way we do things is quite important. At times we don't uh, uh, think it through too much, we don't, we're not too explicit in this. And, um, and these are just some of the key messages, I won't read them all, but um, just that the structure is a means to an end and we don't should be too concerned about structure, how is structure not important, and the community is a space for building bonds of trust. Solidarity. The third key practice is about physical actions. There's a lot of neat examples in the, in the material that we collected. We need to, to be visible, uh, to be to make our voice heard. Um, and there's there's very nice ideas and practices that you can be inspired from, or you can contribute if you um, if you have these kind of experiences. Uh, so some of the key practices to have short-term objectives, but also work in a framework of long-term change. Um, and to try and be persistent. This is also something that we learned in this. Be persistent. Uh, the fourth key practice is about participation. I think there is a very rich experience including here in Bangladesh about this. Uh, so to, to engage with people, to save the people. Uh, we, are, we are people as well. Uh, we, um, so, so participation is something that you can really use all 
about the organizing of, of your activities as an as a activist group. Start from where people are, be united and learn together. Uh, a fifth key practice is networking. Again, I think the realization of this assembly is a very good example of how networking can bring resources, pull resources together and make, uh, make happen things that, that may not be so likely to happen otherwise. Uh, with uh, the limited resources, talking about the economic resources that we have as PHF. So networks are key. Uh, we still need to learn a lot, especially at the global and local global connection. This is something quite peculiar of the people's health movement. There are not many uh, global movements that have this capacity of, of being rooted at the local level, but also acting at the global. But if we, we also feel it's a very, very big challenge. And it's not working well uh, everywhere all the time. So we need to, uh, to learn more. And, um, and the, the sixth one is learning from experience. That's all about the action research approach and process. Uh, and, and, and we feel it's, it's quite promising, so we would like to go on on this. Um, mutual learning, knowledge building, um, and some of the key practices. So, what's going to be the next step of this work that we've been carrying on? First of all, we want to update the material that we put together. It's not, it's not done to stay there, as it's on. It's, it's something that should be um, continuously reworked, and uh, there is a possibility for anyone to share their stories. So, if you have good stories of organizing, carrying out action, uh, please share it on our website and we will incorporate it in the library of experiences and we will do the same from the results of the broader action research. And, uh, and even more importantly, we are committed to continue working to address our challenges and build and share knowledge while doing it. So, this is. Um, just moving towards the end of uh, my presentation. What are our challenges? We discussed a little bit, and they are also mentioned in the report, and we felt uh, it was good to share them at the opening. Some of you are familiar with these, some of you may not be, but you are here, so you are part of, of PHN. So these are the struggles that we all uh, together need to look at and try to address. Uh, the first one, as David was saying, is the consolidating our present at country level. Uh, we, we can do much more, I think, in many countries there is a great potential. And PHM is not about creating new things, but most of the time it's about um, mobilizing or facilitating networking among existing movements and dynamics that are present at country level. So we know that there are people just like-minded, uh, that are active. We need to link them with PHM with uh, more than what we're doing now. And we have a few strategies, so the International People's Health University, the capacity building program that we ran also before this assembly is one great tool that's proven to be quite effective in, in this, uh, towards this end. Um, again, sharing effective practices for mobility and also more effective networking. The second uh, challenge is about the sustainability, uh, which is not just about finance, so it is about securing and, and expanding our financial capacity. Uh, as you may imagine, it's not easy to uh, uh, together to collect uh, funds to support the radical uh, movement, the radical social movement. There's no, I mean, not many governments or donor agencies are willing to support a work that goes against uh, the system. So we need to be creative in the ways we uh, write our applications to funders, but we also need to differentiate the sources uh, of our funding. And also, I think we need to differentiate by put there our resource base, which means increase the, also the amount of voluntary work uh, that, that we can pull together. Uh, that there's a lot of, I mean, that we, we do rely extensively on voluntary work. So we need both things. We need to secure uh, money to cover some essential functions that cannot be done on a voluntary basis, but we need also to increase uh, the, the number of people and the diversity of people who do contribute with their voluntary time and resources. We have been discussing a strategy of uh, membership and affiliation to try and build more um, a more stable way for people to get engaged and to contribute also economically to the life of the movement. Uh, this discussion has been very, very complicated. Uh, some people in the movement don't like the idea of membership. Uh, some people feel that uh, membership is also something that excludes and some other people think that through membership we could be more independent because people would contribute even a little and this would 
reduce our dependency from donors, for example, or agencies that are always trying to put their agenda into their, their funding support mechanisms. So it is, it is an open discussion, and I feel, and we feel, we need even more ideas and experiences with people. This has to could go forward. And third, challenges about communication, and maybe also kind of, we, we do it throughout, of course, but to thank the interpreters who are making uh, the communication across languages possible. Uh, it is something that we try to do in, um, in, in BHM, but we, we should do it uh, much, much more, and I think it is still a barrier, including in Europe. People assume that uh, English is a, is a good uh, language to communicate in Europe. It is not so. There are many uh, countries that are cut off uh, by the use of English, and, and so we, I think even in Europe we are constrained by uh, the over-reliance of just one language, or just one language. And uh, communication means also the ability to get messages out in a way that people can really understand them and they can use them and feel they are their own. Um, and I think we in the PHM uh, for many years and even now we, we struggle a little bit. We have very good reports like the Global Health Watch, it's a very good book, but it's not accessible for many people. They, they will not read it, including in Italy, uh, for a language reason, and it's just uh, too intellectual, it's, it's just too complicated. Uh, okay, so we need other, also other forms of messages that are more uh, usable uh, by, by the people, more empowering for the people. And the final, uh, as David was saying, is about renewal and rotation. Um, the PHM has been doing quite some work in trying to engage new people. I think I am I'm not so young anymore, but I am a product of, of their effort to, uh, to really open up and engage younger people. Uh, but we need to continue uh, in this sense. The two levels, one is governance, so those who represent, who represent in the city council, the regions, the programs, and the networks, and also in the secretariat, which is the small core essential staff of the movement. Uh, we, we have a principle of rotating the location of the secretariat, uh, which means having an office and the capacity to support a few people, and uh, we are a bit stuck in this process because we could not actually uh, we have not been successful in finding new locations. Currently, it's in South Africa and in India, um, and we look forward. We look, yeah, forward to new possibilities for moving it elsewhere. And that's the end. So I'll just uh, close with two, two pictures. Uh, we mentioned Atta Mader uh, several times already. So he was the father of Alma Atta and very, very close to the People's Health Movement. Uh, he's out there in some of the watches. One of our programs is about strengthening WHO, being there, watching what happens in the World Health Organization, trying to bring people's voice there and, and, and make it more heard. And he is very supportive of this program, so I, I'm standing there next to him. It's just to show a very, very inspiring moment when, when we sat with him and we, we felt you know, we were really connected with his struggle and, and our struggle. And this is just from the World Social Forum in Tunis in 2013. It's a group of us carrying on with the same high spirit. So with that spirit, I, I thank you for, the, for listening. I thank you for being here. And I'll say once again, help for all now. Thank, thanks, Kiara. Kiara is both sort of contextual and information that David gave, as well as the uh, more specific report, which is something more real, with an overview of movement building, as well as some of the challenges that PHM faces. This session is an introductory session, so it's not one where we open it up to the floor for participation and questions. That's built into, into other sessions. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank the three speakers very much, and Forward to a successful PHA.
The workshop is this afternoon start at 5 o'clock and now 3 o'clock as it's written. That was one of the things that influenced his future career direction. In 1952, he was allowed to go back to school. After graduating with high marks in pharmacology, he joined the University of Colombo under the tutelage of Dr. Seneca Bibele, who actually served as his mentor for so many years until he went back to become, until Dr. Bibele became the uh, State Pharmaceuticals Corporation head and Dr. Bala stayed on as a pharmacologist at the university. The rest of Dr. Bala's career was focused on promoting rational drug use, social justice, and equity in healthcare. He began in 1978 at the United Nations Conference of Trade and Development in Geneva, where he was part of a team that worked on the involvement of the pharmaceutical sector in low-income countries. In 1981, he took part in the UN Seminar in Pharmaceuticals in Geneva, and that meeting, an organization called Health Action International was born. It was a global network of nonprofit groups representing the interests of consumers in drug policy and lobbying for increased access to essential medicines. In the late 1980s, Dr. Bala took a position as advisor and coordinator of the Health Action International Asia Pacific and relocated to Penang in Malaysia. There he began working for access to essential medicines, lobbying for change. He told everybody, this is not a one-time thing. It needs persistent and continuous movement, persuasion of the government and persuasion of the WHO. But the expertise and the decision will still lie in the people. He is continuously an advisor on national drug policy development in various countries. Dr. Bala consulted at the WHO on many occasions and received the Commonwealth Vice Chancellor Fellowship Award in 1994 and the Ole Hanson Award in 2006. His insights and advice were delivered softly with gentleness and a generosity of spirit that inspired those who knew him. He will always say, the people's health movement is a movement of the people, and most especially, the poor people. So here are some slides of Dr. Bala. During his latter years when we had the meeting of the Health Action International Asia Pacific at the, uh, in Sri Lanka. This was his last year with us because he passed on the coordinatorship to Sheila Rani Kaur. Thank you, Dr. Bala. We truly miss you.
who started off Health Action International. And they were Dr. Bada Subramanian, Abada, Abada, Dr. Zephyr Chaudhry, Dr. Anwar Ghazal, and, and Mira Shiva. These were the shining, wonderful people who started Health Action International. Sheila was born in 1962 in Penang. She was educated in Malaysia. And then, when she had graduated, she started working with these people. She did everything that was needed to coordinate in the way of putting out newsletters and everything else. Then later on, the organization moved from Penang to Colombo, where Dr. Bala led us. And then, at the end of 2010, Dr. Bala retired much to all of our regret, but he needed the rest. And then, there was no funding anymore, which is very sad, so we had no power and no funding. And the organization moved back to Penang. And Sheila took it on single-handedly, having to get jobs herself in order to be able to work for no salary for Health Action International Asia Pacific. One really important thing that Bala and Sheila did together in 1996, they organized a conference to bring all of the 18 independent Pacific Island countries together to share knowledge on developing their essential drugs program. These people are 5,000 kilometers apart, and they're all out there in tiny little dispersed islands. And it was the first time that they had been brought together, and it was so successful and it really um, got them so excited that from then on, WHO funded the meeting to bring them together. But it was Dr. Bala and Sheila who made this happen right at the beginning. And Sheila worked on tirelessly. She was then asked to coordinate the bringing them together of this meeting. But unfortunately, Sheila died in 2017. And we truly, truly miss her. Sheila was not just a coordinator, she was a very wonderful friend and we all loved her and we miss her. Thank you.